Okay. Okay. So, what inspired you to get into the education system? Um, I've worked with kids since I was 14. Wow. Babysitting kids. Wow. 14? Yeah. Like, what brought that passion mm -hmm. into you? Mm, it was mostly just that I was a kid that wanted to make money. Mm. <laughs> and my mom was like, oh, I have some friends that want to hire you to be a caretaker. And one of the kids I watched... She had a really hard time sleeping. It's the main thing I remember about the first kid I ever babysat. So I gave her warm milk and like cinnamon in the milk at night. And then I didn't see her for years. And I saw her like maybe five years ago. I ran into her and she was a teenager. And she said, Oh yeah, you're like, you're the person that watched me that gave me warm milk. And she remembered that too. And that was really cool. How does that feel? Where did you even get the remedy for warm milk and, and cinnamon? How did where did that come about? I think it was my grandma told me to like that warm milk would make you sleepy. <laughs> so I just thought it would be fun to try it. That's dope. Yeah. And I only watched her like a handful of times, maybe five times and she was five or six years old. Isn't it crazy yeah. like the five times that you spent with someone is so impactful that years later they see you and they're like oh my god you had such an impact on my life you know like yeah. was that kind of the inspiration that brought you to pursuing it further along in your career yeah I think it was partly that and then I was super shy as a kid I was really quiet like, everybody would ask me questions and I would just sit there and be like that don't, don't talk to me um and as I got older and watched more and more children, I realized that a lot of those kids grew out of that, and so did I. Mm. And I started getting into the theater, and that was really what changed it all for me, it was like watching kids grow through theater, where they were really shy or weirdly energetic, and like nobody could understand them because they were kind of too much to deal with. Mm -hmm. Right, so it was two opposite spectrums, like really quiet kids and really intense kids. And then theater just changed their life. Mm. Like they were now, they now understood themselves better. Right. And they changed into a different person through that. What do you feel about theater invokes growth in a person's emotional understanding and spiritual connection with themselves? There's just this sense of I am somebody else, so I'm now allowed to experience all of my emotions in a very extreme way. Um, and there's no limit to how you get to experience them. Seriously. I, I'm, I've been so intrigued with theater now, and now that I'm going to get into school, I definitely want to take a theater class. I feel like that invokes a certain level of connectivity that a lot of people don't live with on a daily basis. It seems as though we kind of live in a world where we're, we're conforming and we're not really being so expressive with our own personal emotions. So and theater is such a, such a calling that I respect anyone even willing to put themselves in that fire to understand themselves like that. How did, how did theater impact you personally? Um, well, I went from a really, really quiet and shy child to all of a sudden I was so loud nobody could shut me up. It was pretty funny. And I had an older sister that was really abrasive. Like, she has, like, a very big personality, so I was never allowed to be loud. It's all good. I know, it's a very... Well, no, no, it's got me in it. It's got you, yeah, you're adding taste. You're adding taste to it, That's man. That's JP over there. How y'all doing? Good, man. How are you so, doing? What are you, what are you doing? Interview. With her? Yeah, she's pretty I'll cool. I'll tell you some stories. She don't need to listen. I just ask you. <laughs> You gonna tell him stories about me? No. Okay. Stories about me at your parties. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> She's the life parties. of the party. Oh, you got a cannon, huh? Yeah, yeah. I like it. It's pretty dope, man. It's yeah. pretty dope. Yeah, I had the A1 for many years. It's my favorite yeah. camera I ever had. Yeah, this is my starter. This is my oh, starter. Really? So, like, if I'm good enough, then we'll we'll keep moving on up the food chain. Yeah, my dad was a professional photographer. Fuck good enough. I used to ask him, we can take pictures, and he says, whatever's in front of the camera when I press the button. That's <laughs> the fuck I'm talking yeah. about. Hey, Ron. <laughs> that's Ron. He's cool. Uh, yeah, that's JP. That's Ron. 
Sweet, sweet, sweet. So, 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 theater. How did it impact you? How did it impact you? Um, yeah. So, it went from just me being really shy, and then my sister had a lot. She needed a lot of attention, and so I wasn't really allowed to be loud. Mm. And then I got into theater, and I was super loud and never stopped talking. And I realized, wow, that was a part of me. It was within me to be really proud and really vibrant and stand on the stage and have everyone stare at me. And I felt good doing that. So it completely changed the way I looked at the world. I was like, oh, I could be vibrant. I could shine. I could have everybody stare at me in a room. And I feel comfortable with that. How, how does that feel? The first time that you're in front of a large group of people, are you overanalyzing yourself? Are you just giving giving away your emotional your emotional currency is how, how do you connect to the crowd and remain whole at the same time because I'm still trying to learn that personally mm -hmm. um, it felt like I was experiencing emotion through another person so when you're playing a character you're channeling emotions that you already have through someone else and it feels like a much safer way to experience your emotions mm. whereas like if you in the moment feel really angry and you just want to scream at somebody it feels like unkind right we're not allowed to do that so you channel that in another way and so for me it was channeling it through a different character mm. did you ever feel the burden of the characters that you were channeling or was yeah. this okay? Okay, that's that's interesting. Yeah. How how did how did the, that ex, how did that affect you or benefit you? Well, that's when I realized it wasn't really a healthy avenue for me. It wasn't what I needed anymore because it was more about me building confidence as a child. And then when I got to um, college, I was still a theater major, and I took a class that was trying to be like you live the life of the character and that felt really uncomfortable um, and one of the characters I was supposed to play was this character from a Streetcar Named Desire and she's a very famous character where she's just falling apart and she kind of falls into the ground and her life's in shambles and she has nothing left she has no money she was once very wealthy and had everything and my teacher had me like fall to the ground and imagine that I was homeless and that I had nothing left wow. and I remember that stuck with me for like two weeks of just feeling extremely sad because I had tried to embody the full weight of what that would feel like did you did you tap into like a, a trauma or how, how can you being as you lived a different life relate to someone who lived a, a whole different life as well? I don't think it tapped into something I had experienced. It was just more like, wow, this is so painful. I don't want to imagine it. Mm -hmm. And trying to embody it is so uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Whereas I'm sure for some people it's cathartic. It's not always cathartic. It feels like you're just creating another source of pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's deep. That's super deep. Yeah, when you've already experienced pain in other ways, and now you're trying to imagine somebody else's pain, you're just kind of layering on to ways you could be sad or feel sadness. Did you feel at some point in your theater journey that you you didn't want to subject yourself to that to that type of emotional stress? Yeah, that was the breaking point. I was already really not a happy person at that point in my life already, and then just trying to get heavier and heavier felt really unnecessary to feel like growth. It felt like I was pulling myself down. Mm -hmm. So at what point did you figure out how to build yourself up and not only do that, but now you're building other people up by subjecting yourself to, to teaching them? I've talked to a lot of people who say that improv they think is really hard, and I don't think it is because improv is daily life. 
we walk around the world and we consistently react in time to what's happening around us. And that's really what teaching is, is improvisation. Like, the kid doesn't want something, so you kind of work around it and try to figure out what they do want. And then you keep changing your angle and why you're doing it and how you're doing it. And that's consistent improv. And that's what people do generally, right? In a conversation that's improv, mm -hmm. and in a work, like any kind of work, you're making it up as you go. And yeah, even in life, I mean, we lived our lives without certain amenities, and now that things have been taken away from us, we have to adjust and, and move forward. So yeah. that's a constant. I think, I think in every part of, of life where we're improv because we don't have the answer of, of the future, we just know right now. And every time that we move, we, we're moving as if it's a new learning experience, and what, what may come may come, you know. So, being as you're in the educational system, do you do you enjoy what you do now, or do you feel like it's it's emotionally stimulating towards you? Yeah, I think so. I think that a lot of what I get, a lot of what I do, could transfer to other fields. Mm -hmm. um, but I think a lot of why I like it is because it's healing, and I see the immediate way that it helps people, like I see the progress in a child more quickly than I would in other forms of work. <laughs> you see the change so much more rapidly because they're just so quickly evolving. And that feels really exciting to watch. And the idea of shaping a human is so interesting. Um, where if you're a teacher, you kind of work with them for the one year and you shape them in certain ways. But if you're more like on the caretaker level, which is what preschool teaching is and different forms of nannying, like you're involved in that child's life mm -hmm. in a very good way. You're almost as if like the supplementary parent yeah. in, in, a, in a way. Yeah, you're teaching them life skills. Do you, do you have, con do you see conflictions with the way that you vision life for kids and the way that their parents are visioning their life for their children? I've seen it in the past, but oftentimes I end up finding families that have a similar view to mine. Okay. Where it works. Because it's very challenging to try to like, impart your views to a child when the parents disagree with what you're teaching their kids. Right. It doesn't usually work out very well. <laughs> That's a tough yeah. one. <laughs> yes. And you try to compartmentalize, right? Like, so as an educator, like if you're working more at a school, then you're only allowed to kind of teach as much as you don't want to be like, oh, so my opinion of this is blah, 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 blah. But when you're in somebody's house, mm -hmm. inevitably your opinions come up a lot more. Of course. And so that shapes the kid in a whole other way. Yes. And that's really interesting because you don't always know you're doing it. Like you just start kind of being yourself. Improving. Yeah. <laughs> and then you realize later, oh, this kid remembers. <laughs> it was definitely an opinion and not a fact. It, right. it wasn't me compartmentalizing. It was me just saying what I felt like saying. Of course, we can only be ourselves. We. That's that's the best. That's all we have to work with. So, what a children, what a child picks up is, is so is so random. The things that I remember as a child are little snapshots, right? It's not nothing that I intentionally said, hey, I want to remember this, you know? So, you know, that, that's, a, that's a beautiful part of, of just our upbringing in general. Are, have there been instances where you see neglect in the child's life or are things that may spark your mind to want to explore more about this child? Why is this this way? Like, well, what do you think? 
That was a really good method. Build on what they've already conceptualized. That's awesome. That's smart because it's safe. It it helps it helps you stay in the role and not cross any boundaries and it also allows the parents to guide their child in the direction they see is safe. It's it's it, that's very professional. It's very professional. Hmm. It's also just building on curiosity. So if you don't ever ask a kid what they think, then you're just telling them what to think. Mm-hmm. And that's not the point. The point is that you're building on their own curiosity. If they are asking questions, um, it'd be nice if they could come up with their own conclusion, whether it's right or wrong. It'd be nice for them to just guess. Mm-hmm. And that's really what you're doing, is just saying, what do you if you could guess anything at all, what would be your guess? Mm. And, and nothing is right or wrong, right? It's a safe space to be. And usually I'll just say, that's interesting. <laughs> what, would, what would be your ideal society? How, how do you see the world in a progressive manner? Sometimes I'll talk to adults and say, this is a thing that I do with small children. And they'll laugh and they'll be like, ha ha ha. And they'll think like, what are you comparing me to a small child? No. Hmm. The thing is that we forget when people become adults that we're still children at heart. And that there's still a way to be soft and gentle and thoughtful and caring with adults because we're still constantly forming and changing. And a lot of us didn't even have the skills that we're teaching now to kids. So a lot of us didn't have that structure, and we're learning it now as an adult, whereas yeah. some people learned it when they were five years old. Right? right. So it's that same, I think in a perfect world, we would constantly approach everybody with that sense of care and thoughtfulness and just realize that we're all learning and we're all working together to help each other. Instead of like, oh, you should know everything you know by now. Mm-hmm. Done learning. Your your thoughts or your reactions to things are just gonna like, trigger me. Instead of like, let's help each other learn. Exactly. Exactly. Hmm. I'm thankful. I'm thankful for our conversations. I'm thankful for more people with your mindset that are in this society that we have and they're trying to push the generation forward in a, in a good loving way and with, I mean without love we don't have anything and so I feel like over time I think certain entities are trying to keep us from 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 unionizing and and being one whole family because that's profitable and it, it drives the dollar but I think when we come together we could we could make things so communal and so full of love that no one feels like they're they're lacking in any way. That's that's my vision personally, and I think the way that you're teaching the children, the way that you're receptive to to their ideas, I think that that's contributing to it. That's that's part of the reason why I wanted to interview, just because our energy when I first met you was just full of love and inter- and just openness. And you just invited me to your birthday, and that was beautiful, you know. And I could tell that from all the friends that you had that. Um, everyone cared about you genuinely and wholly you know I felt that personally so that was the energy that you brought and I felt you needed you you deserve a a place to speak and be open because other people should hear beautiful voices and beautiful energies in this world so I appreciate you I appreciate you you. one of my favorite things I'd like to add is a recent thing that happened two days ago where, you know, every kid you've ever met says, that's not fair. Mm -hmm. And so I always struggle with that, right? I'm like, okay, what's happening where we're not, you know, talking to kids correctly about fairness and what that means? Mm -hmm. So I told them what fairness means. And I was like, fairness means that it's within the guidelines. It's within the rule book. So if we play a game of sorry, and we all agree to the rules, and you win, and I lose, that's fair. Mm-hmm. 
if I have three cookies and I only want to give you one, that's also mm. because they're my cookies to begin with, right? It's within my own rules and my own guidelines. Equal is I have four cookies, I give you two, I keep two. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then I kept consistently repeating that message of like, okay, well, we've agreed to do this thing together. These are the rules and the guidelines. Once we agree upon them, it's all fair. Mm -hmm. This is fairness. Things being equal, is very, it's like very uncommon for things to be perfectly equal, right? But they can be sometimes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's enough opportunity that you can provide everybody with the same thing that you have. But sometimes there isn't. Mm -hmm. So there was that consistent reminder, and they drew these hilarious pictures. One of the kids was like, okay, so a fair is one set of people has an umbrella and the other son of he doesn't and it rains on him that's fair and I was like yeah because the son of he had the umbrella but he didn't have to share it he mm -hmm. could if he wanted to but right. he had it to begin with I don't know why they were son of he it was really <laughs> funny and then, and then <laughs> equal was one son of Pete gets 500 cookies and the other son of Pete also gets 500 cookies mm -hmm. and I was like okay sure <laughs> <laughs> and then the second yeah. one was even better. It was one bean gets a mushroom and the other bean doesn't get one. That's fair. And then the next one, of course, had to do with cookies again because kids love cookies. So it was like both beans get the equal amount of cookies. Right. It was just so funny. I was like, why are we using beans <laughs> and centipedes? I'm really confused. But they were trying to understand They were conceptualizing it. Yeah, it, yeah. They were making it goofy. <laughs> right. They're kids. They're seven. That's the beautiful part about yeah. kids is like there's there's so much room like, for oh, error. I get it, a centipede. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it was really funny because I was like, okay, well let's keep going with this. And then next I talked to my friends about this. It was like, okay, equal opportunity, mm. right? Which is different than equal. You have an umbrella, I have an umbrella. You don't have to use it. Mm. We both have an umbrella. We could use it if we wanted to. You could decide. You don't want to use yours. Yeah, you chose right? to be. You chose to be a resident That's of Portland. That's even different you know? from what equal is. That's equal opportunity. Right. There's so many. There's so many yeah. different. There's so many. It's different. like so equal, it's like, and okay, then. Okay, let's understand this without <laughs> yeah. getting really political about it. Like, let's talk about this on a really basic level. On a, on a preschool what, level, literally. What you think fair is is not what fair is. Right. And adults will say shit like that. Mm -hmm. It's not fair. It's not fair. Like, well, it is. Like, right. if these were the rules, the parameters, you said, I want to live within society. I'm going to pay taxes. I'm going to follow these rules. And you don't follow the rules, and you get punished for those choices. That's fair. Mm -hmm. You agreed to those terms. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, like, click OK, I agree on an iTunes agreement. Oh, yeah. And then you don't follow the agreement and you get in trouble, that's fair. Right. Because you didn't follow the rules. You agreed to following them and you chose not to. So do you feel like we should we should remake the rules, right? This is, this is a crazy idea of mine, right? You should remake the rules and then have everyone physically sign contracts so that it's it's in stone. There's no more there's no more uh, misinterpretation, you know? We're all on the same page. Do you feel like the the a new declaration of independence should be should be created? That would be so monumental. That would be very cool. <laughs> That would be really cool. I think a lot of us don't understand what we're agreeing to in society and we do it blindly because it makes our lives easier. Right. right? So we love the convenience of like, oh well I just want to listen to music whenever I want. I'm gonna agree to whatever this means if it means I get to listen to my favorite music. Exactly. I don't care what it is. So we could be signing away our rights at any moment in time. Yeah, I'm a victim of definitely signing the I agree, I agree yeah, on, the, on all the apps. Do. Yeah, we all do. Right, so I always think about the weird guy or the weird woman who actually goes through and reads every single new term of agreement, but... And what's hard is I've done that before. I did that recently. <laughs> that's so cool. That's interesting. And, I, and then, well, not every word, but I read through, you know, the first page 
That's dope. I was already irritated by it. <laughs> I was like, well, this, I don't agree to any of this. <laughs> right. So I didn't accept the app, but then I was considering after disagreeing, like, how much harder it would be to find something else to do the same thing for me, right. and then already willing to sign my rights away for this <sighs> app, just because it'd be easier, because of the ease. Right. Do you remember, do you recall anything that really stood out to you when you were reading that agreement? It was uh, one of those data tracking things. So mm. it was something really silly where it was like a app that helped you save money. And Hold on one moment. Yeah. Because I think we may have gone past 30. Yeah. Yep. Oh, sweet. This is the coolest 30 minutes in... This is by far the coolest 30 minute interview I've ever had. I'm just gonna be honest with you. Like, it's, we still have time on the clock and we, we're getting deep, all right? So, the first thing. So you said data tracking. Like, yeah. what is that about? So they're like, okay, if you agree to this app, then that means we get to track all the things you do on your phone, basically. Everything yeah. out, outside of the, yeah. the main app, okay. And some of them are like, we're just gonna track your location, right? That's a common one, we're gonna track your location. And some of them are, we're going to track even your internet usage. And they say that within the agreement. And you're like, but you're tracking me for what reason? And you realize what you just agreed to. And you're like, I did that so I could get, like, a coupon. Yeah. Like, why did I agree to them tracking everything I do so that I could get, you know, 5 $10 off mm -hmm. of something or whatever this app was saying it was going to do they're smart. Like, is they, it worth that? The baby incentive. Really. Yeah, the baby yeah. incentive gets it gets them every time, and bam, they, they latch on, and they're stuck. They're stuck for life now. My only thing is, I still don't really understand the benefit of the data tracking outside of, I guess, consumer marketing. That that makes sense. It makes sense. We're here. Yeah. Okay. But got my it. favorite was my friend was like, "Oh, Geico told me they give me fifteen percent off if they could track my phone." Mm -hmm. And she realized that it was tracking, like, every time she would stop abruptly, like, the jerk stops would be tracked and everything. And so they were trying to track her driving. Wow. And then she realized. That's, that's yeah, incredible. Yeah, was saying, it's precise. oh, but we're not going to use this against you to raise your insurance prices. Bullshit. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> Why else would they follow everything you're doing and be like, oh, today you had a really abrupt stop. What was that about? Or today you ran through a stoplight. Ooh. What was that about? Right? And they're following everything. Okay. Okay. And they're like, but it's not going to affect your prices, but we're giving you a discount right now so we can track it. Oh, that's right? smart. That's smart. On their side. Yeah, on their side. It's really fucked up. But they were supposed to, like, they... They told her ahead of time, which is what's interesting, because most websites or apps don't even tell you they're mm. doing it. They just do it. Oh, wow. So I was kind of surprised that they were required to ask for permission. Yeah, I think now they're definitely, because I feel like there's more people saying, hey, what's in between the fine print? So now that they're doing that, I think they're, we're holding businesses and companies more accountable every day, which I appreciate. That's the beauty of all these new apps that are coming. They're, they're exposing companies essentially within the app so they are getting blocked at certain points but they get far enough to get the message out and that's important so yeah that's that's incredible that's incredible that's yeah. it's crazy so that it's critical yeah. thinking is what it is and it's i mean that's hard to teach to children or to adults but it's also like what are your values I'm trying to follow hmm. your values but also trying to help people understand what is this versus this, right? Mm. We often mis misuse terms and put labels and judgments on things and we don't even really know what we're saying, Yeah. right? Like fairness versus equality. Like they are not the same thing. Okay. Egalitarianism, right? They're all different things. I'm not really familiar with egalitarianism. What, what is that? That one's really interesting because I thought it was more similar to what people consider equality. And I still don't fully understand what the term is, but it's kind of, it's more like the level up. So, right, the, there's the term, um, pull yourself up by your own straps. Mm -hmm. So the opposite would be like, let me help you tie your boots. Okay. 
Okay. So that'd be more like 